Welcome to The Ride Inside with Mark Barnes, a podcast about the mental, emotional, and social aspects of motorcycling. Brought to you by the BMW Motorcycle Owners of America and the MOA Foundation. Mark Barnes is a clinical psychologist and moto journalist with decades of experience in both fields. But nothing in this podcast should be considered a way to diagnose or treat mental illness. We're all just trying to get through this thing called life, and motorcycles are one of the ways we do it. If you're in a crisis, or ride a KTM, please seek professional help. We'd love to answer your questions too, so send them to podcast at bmwmoa.org. I'm Mark Barnes, and this essay is entitled, How to Organize a Garage or Not. As I've mentioned elsewhere recently, I just moved. I was very excited about the new accommodations for my bikes, trailer, tools, gear, and other moto miscellany. My present garage is much larger than the most recent one and has an adjoining workshop that's part of a finished basement. I'd envisioned this seemingly vast combined space as capable of swallowing everything from my old garage and dungeon-esque basement with lots of room to spare, enough for a couple of personal watercrafts I'd been keeping at a friend's house, and maybe even a car. I've never had room for one of those before. I was utterly delusional. It's become abundantly clear the personal watercrafts will have to remain in exile with their enormous trailer. A small car will barely fit in the garage, but only if I keep my electric trials bike in the downstairs den. At least there's no oil to drip or gas fumes to smell. That machine isn't much larger than a mountain bike, so that tells you how cramped things are. The garage is packed so tightly Access to most anything requires temporarily rearranging other stuff, Tetris style. I hadn't taken into consideration how the bulky built-in shelving would interfere with my exploitation of the raw square footage, and it turns out the neatly rectangular basement workshop's capacity is far less than what my ancient catacombs held in their multitude of convoluted recesses. I've jettisoned a ridiculously excessive accumulation of parts and scraps that had seemed potentially useful during the hoarding process, but making the new facility functional still requires serious organizational effort. No doubt, another trip to the dump is in my future. I've set up a half dozen garages in the past, but none posed this much challenge, either because they were even more spacious or I had less to squeeze into them. In addition to all this, my move was executed in a chaotic rush due to some peculiar timing constraints. In the past, I've had the luxury of a more leisurely pace and could thoughtfully map out where everything would go before transporting it. I'd have my shelving, racks, workbench, and other infrastructure in place first, ready to provide familiar homes for the granular contents of my garage as I carried them over. This time, I hauled it all as one jumbled mess. Contents and infrastructure had to be moved as quickly as possible altogether and ended up piled floor to ceiling with little or no forethought regarding their eventual arrangement. When the time finally came to start organizing, most of it had to be dragged out into the driveway just to create enough open space to assemble shelves and position large items along the walls. While this situation has been frustrating and disorienting, it's made me think about the process of organization in new ways. When I could lay out my garage ahead of installing everything, I'd carefully consider what would fit where, maybe with the help of some graph paper and cut-out scale models of the major pieces to be arranged. I'd also think about workflow, so things would be stored near the areas where they'd be used and interference with ingress and egress would be minimized. This amounted to a rather abstract, cerebral puzzle 
enjoyable in itself. Such planning would be accompanied by excitement focused on whatever advantages the new space held over the previous one. However, in each case, much of my speculative imagining would prove inaccurate. Yes, Cabinet X did fit in the designated space, but I hadn't allowed enough room for its doors to swing open easily with me standing there. The lugs I'd put in the floor for my tire change stand had it located awkwardly close to my trailer's tongue, so making a complete revolution around its circumference required stepping over the tongue or moving the trailer. A bunch of tools and supplies were shelved conveniently next to my workbench, but I mainly used them in the other bay, where I wound up doing most of my bike disassembly. In the midsummer heat, I had no good place to put my fan. The list goes on. Substantial revisions to the original organization would always be required as I actually lived and worked in the space and discovered the discrepancies between my early fantasies and subsequent realities. Another type of discrepancy has become apparent, too. Having now made considerable progress imposing organization on my current space, my reflexes are stuck in the old world order. I decided it makes the most sense to put toolbox A here, but I keep reaching for it over there because that's where I'm used to having it. Which system should take priority, logic or tradition? In wondering about this, I've realized every organizational schema I've ended up with over the years has involved a great deal of idiosyncratic, completely illogical arrangement, especially where there is no clear functional advantage to a certain setup. I've defaulted to a fundamentally emotional orientation. It's the difference between putting all my old record albums in alphabetical order so anyone could find a particular title efficiently, versus grouping them by nostalgic themes. For example, this dozen is associated with this past romance, so I can find a particular title most efficiently. Hence, toolboxes A, B, and C always go in that order, left to right, because I got them in that order. Same goes for the boxes of takeoff parts and spares for my current collection of bikes. Oldest bike stuff goes on the bottom shelf, newest on the top. What about those half dozen tires awaiting trial? Of course, the ones with the coolest looking tread patterns go at the most visible end of the lineup. The dirt gear cabinets go to the right of the street gear cabinets because that's how they've always been since I needed more than one cabinet for my gear. Solvents go on the top shelf of supplies with brake and clutch servicing items next because that's how a revered personal mentor kept his. Automotive fluids get relegated to the bottom supply shelf because, obviously, they're automotive and not motorcycle-related. Even when it involves a functional disadvantage, I might still opt for an emotionally driven arrangement. My rolling tool cart collected a slew of stickers on its right side years ago when I was heavily into KTM dirt bikes and rode with a like-minded gang. Said cart was tucked against the right end of my workbench then. Now, Even though I'd have more room to open its drawers if it faced north in its current corner, I've got that cart facing east so I can still see those stickers and enjoy the fond memories they evoke. Organization, at least for me, is a more organic process than I had in mind while bemoaning the seemingly disastrous disorder resulting from my hurried move. Lacking the overestimated benefit of a comprehensively thought-out, pre-planned order, I've been forced to use plain old trial and error in coming up with an arrangement. While it feels less efficient to move all my stuff back and forth, I just might be sorting out problems sooner rather than later. 
in the process of moving the actual things into place, I can spot conflicts I might not have thought of during imaginative planning. Proactively logical ordering is always limited by failures of anticipation. In an odd way, memories and imagination, the bases of anticipation, often require external prompts to take shape. You may only recall the treehouse from your childhood when you see the old tree where it had been. I may only realize the need for a wide berth around my tire change stand when my shin touches my trailer's tongue and I'm reminded of a more painful impact years ago. Revisions will no doubt still be necessary later when I perform tasks in this space for the first time, but I expect fewer of them. Organizing my garage in this decidedly uncerebral way seems more pragmatic, and I'm automatically putting things where they feel right, even if it's not entirely rational. All my garage and workshop areas in the past have eventually evolved into exactly this kind of organization. I might as well let it happen from the start. Even with that attitude, I expect this will be a multi-year process wherein layers of organization accumulate like the formation of a pearl based on repetition. That's where something has always been. Happenstance, oh look, it fits right there, and other illogical factors. Just now, I realized an old bike rack I no longer use as such is perfect for holding a cylindrical light in a crucial spot. There's absolutely no way I'd have thought of that without serendipitously holding both items in my hands at the same time. The organization that develops over time depends on many such fortuitous revelations, not carefully logical planning. When it first occurred to me I might write about the ordeal of tackling the chaos in my garage, I would thought I'd try to come up with some universally applicable ideals for setting up a proper wrenching environment. What I've realized is the ideal arrangement for any particular individual is so personal, few, if any, overarching principles can be applied. The book on garage feng shui is nothing but blank pages. Sorry, but you're on your own. The BMW MOA Foundation is a 5013C nonprofit dedicated to improving rider safety by providing programs supporting motorcycling and its rich heritage. The Foundation's mission is built to provide and promote programs for first-time riders with an emphasis on youth, women, and families, and to support a variety of educational and training programs related to safe motorcycling. The Foundation has two prominent programs, the Paul B. Scholarship and Safe Miles. The Paul B. Memorial Scholarship Fund honors the memory of Paul Bayshores, an avid motorcyclist with a big heart and a love for his BMW riding community. Paul B. Scholarship awards grants to individuals in the motorcycle riding community to help them pursue rider education and training. MOA members can receive up to a $250 grant for successfully completing any sanctioned motorcycle training course. Anyone who is not an MOA member can receive up to $100. Once you've scheduled and paid for your approved training course, submit your application to paulb at bmwmoaf.org. It's important to note the application must be submitted before the training course is completed. The MOA Foundation's Safe Miles program is in the process of establishing a million-dollar endowment to fund the future of rider safety, education, and training. Donors to the Safe Miles Endowment receive special benefits like a one-year renewal of their MOA membership, automatic entries to Foundation raffles, a donor dinner at the National Rally, a Foundation polo shirt, and more. Learn more and make your donation to the Foundation now by visiting the Foundation's website at bmwmoaf.org and clicking on Safe Miles.
On the ride inside today, I'm going to be talking again with Wes Fleming, who uh, you know from the podcast Chasing the Horizon. Hello. We will be uh, responding uh, today in part to a listener's uh, comment or a reader's comment, um, Rich, uh, on December 1st. And I guess I should say the year now that we've crossed over. Uh, that was way back in 2021. Commented on a piece called Zen and the R1250 RS. Uh, he questioned how increased complexity, especially electronic and other factors, uh, reducing the margin for DIY maintenance and repair, uh, things like proprietary diagnostics and uh, right to repair limitations, uh, practical if not legal, uh, might interfere with the experience of quality with that capital Q, uh, as, as Persig uh, was referring to it, um, by alienating a rider from their machine. Persig was uh, clearly very involved mechanically with his Honda in, in the famous uh, Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, uh, while his riding companion on a more sophisticated BMW uh, took a very hands-off approach and had a less intimate relationship with his bike. Yeah, which um, I got to tell you, Mark, uh, right off the bat, I actually find that really amusing because... Um, his riding buddy, whose name is escaping me right now, uh, rode, if I remember correctly, an R60 slash two, which is one of the most simple BMWs I think they've ever created. Um, now, of course, for 1968 or 69, when they were taking this ride, it was top of the line, you know, cutting edge technology. But from my perspective, looking back, um, the R60 is so easy to work on <laughs> compared to modern BMWs. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a, it's kind of funny in that respect. Um, but you know, I, I kind of get where he's coming from and, and what, what you're saying and what rich is, what rich commented, the, the electronics on modern motorcycles are pretty intimidating. Yeah. And I, I don't know whether this is true for you, but um, I've certainly talked to plenty of other uh, home mechanics who would join me in saying, uh, I hate electrical work. Oh, dude. I absolutely despise it. I, but I love mechanical work. And I'm right there uh, with you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, mechanical work, uh, you can actually see what you're doing, and yeah. uh, it, it, or you can at least imagine physical forces, even in a hidden uh, chamber of the motor, um, what they do makes sense in an everyday sort of way. Yeah. Um, you know, we're familiar with how leverage operates or, um, you know, things turning or mm. um, uh, and, and electronics completely different. Uh, they do not behave in ways that we have everyday references for. You really have to have a kind of specialized knowledge for that. Not, not that mechanics don't also have specialized knowledge, but um, it, it's a whole, it's a qualitatively different endeavor. It to really is. Di diagnose and address uh, electrical problems. And, um, you know, a, the epoxy sealed black box is, <laughs> I mean, it's just a total mystery uh, to someone without special education in how uh, diodes and transistors and capacitors and every, all that other stuff works, circuit boards that, I mean, I, I just immediately uh, check out at that yeah. point. That's like, that's for somebody else to fix. Yeah. That won't be me. Yeah, I had a, a big learning curve when um, BMW switched. BMW is what, what I have most of my technical knowledge about these days. 
and they switched from what we might consider a regular electronics on their motorcycles with wiring harnesses that, you know, are almost one wire for one purpose. Uh, not, not quite exactly that, but pretty close. Uh, and then when they went to the, the 1200 generation, the R1200 generation, they went to the CAN bus and all of a sudden, all of my, I felt like all of my electronic knowledge had just gone right out the window when in fact, you know, I just needed to learn the new system, but it was super intimidating and it, you know, it allowed the manufacturer to reduce the number of wires on the motorcycle. Um, it, it increased the reliance on computers, which are on, and most motor vehicles, not just motorcycles and certainly not just BMW, those computers are black boxes. They're sealed. You cannot get into them. You cannot understand what they're, what they do. You don't know how they work. You just right. know what the error codes are. And it, it, it sometimes makes you feel helpless when you have an electronic problem. And uh, that can be very disconcerting. And, and the idea of alienating the rider from the machine kind of pops up pretty quickly when you're, when you, we start talking about electronic problems. Yeah. Let's make a distinction in two terms that uh, I guess sometimes are used interchangeably, but they are truly different. There's electrical and there's electronic. Yeah, and yes, that it, is true. I mean, bikes have always had electrical systems. Yep. Uh, that's, that's not an, it. and you know, tracing a, a bad ground or, uh, a short circuit or, you know, something like that has, that's not something that freaks me out. It's the electronics where you're not just talking about um, energizing a circuit uh, that has a single purpose. Like you were just saying, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're talking about something that is managed by invisible um uh, forces <laughs> that, that we can't possibly uh, discern. Yeah. I imagine that uh, motorcycle manufacturers now have to hire computer programmers, you know, to, to develop the code that oh, goes absolutely. into these things. And, yeah. and that can be, that can be for somebody who has come up in the IT industry and now uh, works part-time in cybersecurity. Even that adds a la another layer of, uh, alienation and intimidation in, in some respects. Well, yes. And again, we're, we're not only talking about like specialized knowledge. We're also talking about things that are designed to be inscrutable because yeah. they're proprietary. Yeah. And, and so uh, even if you know how computers work, you don't know how this code has been set up. Right. And it's a, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think there's no doubt that, w that um, these things do alienate us uh, from our bikes on the maintenance end. And then there's also the issue of as a rider, let's say you don't even bother doing any of your own work um, as a rider, there's the I was going to say age old, but I guess it's not all that old <laughs> age, age old issue of you know, what have electronic rider aids done in this very same regard? Do they alienate yeah. someone from the motorcycle or from uh, the experience of riding by, uh, you know, reducing the skills that have to be developed or by insulating a person from different sensations or, yeah. or responsibilities in uh, piloting a motorcycle. So, uh, it, it, uh, has an effect on that front as well. Yeah. That's one of the, I think that's one of the more common criticisms of modern motorcycles that come from people who have been riding, especially for a long time. And, you know, they remember they've owned multiple bikes that did not have ABS, that did not have traction control, that did not have wheelie control, did not have, you know, this, that, and the other. And, uh, one of the common, gripes that we hear from folks like that is that today's new rider doesn't have to develop the safety skills that a rider 30 years ago had to develop just to stay alive on the motorcycle because it's so easy to rely on abs and traction control you know and uh 
and I, it's almost become a caricature uh, of my life at this point. If I don't mention my Indian FTR 1200, at least once <laughs> on everything that I participate on, but it has, you know, ABS that works in while you're leaned over, it has traction control that works in high speed cornering. It has wheelie control to keep the front wheel on the ground. And it also has so much power that all of these things are necessary. And I'm a pretty experienced rider. Now I'm not going to say I'm an expert rider, but I am certainly experienced and I've owned motorcycles that didn't have any of those things. And I've owned motorcycles that only had a few of them, you know, notably ABS is um, more and more prevalent in the industry on bikes that don't have a lot of other things. Sure. And I turned all those things off one day after I'd had the bike for about a year and scared the crap out of myself, you know, because it wanted to wheelie up through the change into fourth gear, Mark. Yeah. That's how much power this bike has and turning all those things on tamed the bike down to where I was less scared and therefore able to have more fun. Yeah. So it begs the question, which, which setup is actually more alienating, right? If you can feel more comfortable and safe on your bike, are you not in a more intimate, trusting relationship with it? Yeah. As opposed to the alienation of something that feels like it's going to spit you off at any minute. Yeah. Well, and especially when you start talking about Persig's idea of quality, cap, capital Q quality, you know, I think one of the mistakes that a lot of people who read that book in their youth, which is kind of where we form these attachments, you know, to our cultural touchstones. Um, we, like I read that book for the first time at probably 20 years old, maybe 19 so I owned a CB750, which was a, a, a ubiquitous Honda, you know, sure. it was the, the, right. the typical UJM inline four cylinder um, disc brakes in the front, drum brakes in the rear. You had to plan your stops well ahead. Uh, no ABS, no nothing, you know, carburetors, you know, pet cocks, uh, just the whole nine yards. It was as basic a motorcycle as you could get. How about and, those spindly forks? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The twitch and flex and bend. <laughs> um, yeah. Good stuff. Um, but it was it was a very simple motorcycle looking back. And so in my mind, even now, when I go back and reread Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, when Persig starts talking about capital Q quality, that's the bike that's in my mind. Mm -hmm. And even I, who pays attention to modern motorcycles... I've kind of in my head resisted the almost necessity to adjust the idea of quality along with the advancements in motorcycles. Well, a simpler motorcycle, a more elemental machine. Okay. Okay. Does invite a kind of involvement that, that enriches the relationship. However, you know, I'd have to say that my, I've got a R1250 RS now that is easily the most technologically sophisticated oh, yeah. uh, machine I've ever owned. Um, and I, as I've written, um, I mean, my experience of that bike is quintessentially one of quality with a capital Q. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I would never attempt to do repairs on that bike in the same way that I would with, with bikes I've owned in the, in the past. Um, but its ability to, to just function in ridiculously good ways, um, it, it, it just, it, I, I struggled to articulate this, but it just, it, it, it just, the experience is one that is saturated with a sense of quality yeah. as uh, you know, in all the dimensions. Um, so do you as, feel, do you feel as connected to that motorcycle as you have with others in before? Like, do you get that sense of alienation? No, I don't get, I don't feel alienated while I'm riding it. 
Okay. If, if I were forced to uh, try to figure out what was wrong with it because it had stopped working <laughs> uh, and, and I'm out on the highway somewhere, um, I believe I might, I might then feel <laughs> quite alienated and contemptuous of it. But yeah. Um, <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so, so maybe these are really, uh, these, these two dimensions have to be addressed separately. Yeah, I think you're right. The issue of feeling insulated is, I, I, I keep flashing to uh, Matthew Crawford's books. Um, I know you're familiar with them and I'll just note for people listening that um, if you haven't read shop class, as soul craft or why we drive, but especially shop class as soul craft, you have really missed out. This is uh, someone who has a profoundly deep understanding of uh, the value and joy of working on uh, mechanical things. Yeah. Um, and he really turns upside down our uh, cultural hierarchy of, of putting um, so-called uh, mind work over hand work. Uh, because when you are doing hand work, A, you have to use your mind a whole lot. Um, and he would say you have to use it even more than when you're operating in the sterile uh, standardized ether of theory that uh, when you're working with something in the dirty, irregular um, environment of mechanical operation, uh, you have to get it right. You can't do something that makes sense to you uh, and stop there. Yeah the thing is going to work or it's not going to work. You have immediate uh, irrefutable evidence of uh, the accuracy of your thinking. Whereas when you're afloat in abstraction, uh, there are all sorts of things that might make sense there. But when you go to apply them in a real world setting, uh, you know, something breaks down. They, they don't actually, uh, work as well as you had imagined they would, but there's no imagination when you are working on something and, you know, you've either fixed it or you haven't. Yeah. Yeah. And after I read Crawford's first book, the shop class of soul craft book, um, I, I don't want to say I discovered my love for working on motorcycles, but I, definitely felt much more comfortable exploring it because as, as somebody who up to that point had only ever done mind work, you know, I kind of looked at my motorcycle mechanical work as a necessary evil of owning the beast. You know, it, 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 it pays to know how to adjust your chain and it pays to know how to put new, sprockets on and to change your own oil and to check your own valves. Those things are, are necessary if you want to do the kind of writing that I like to do, which is not just weekend or writing. You know, I, I found myself um, almost through owning a succession of CB seven fifties that were in various states of repair. Um, I had to know how to fix my motorcycle. Otherwise I was going to be walking, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you run out of friends, just like as you get older, you find fewer friends willing to help you move house. Um, <laughs> as you, as you uh, go through your life as a motorcycle owner, you do start to run out of friends who are willing to come pick you up with their truck, you know, especially mm -hmm. if it happens all the time. <laughs> uh, you know, my friends don't mind helping me once or twice, but you know, when it comes, becomes uh chronic they're like you know what maybe you should uh, call somebody else next time yeah, you um, don't get frequent flyer miles yeah but after i read shop class i i felt much more okay i guess with the idea of working on 
not just my motorcycle, but then even other people's motorcycles. And I, I guess, I don't want to say I, I felt like it was beneath me before that, but there was something about it that felt dirty in a figurative sense. Um, because obviously working on your motorcycle is a little dirty in a literal sense. Mm -hmm. But after I read that book, I, I lost that, that feeling. And, and I no longer saw mechanical work on a motorcycle as dirty work. Yeah. Um, and it became something that I really, even to this day, really enjoy. Now I have not yet read why we drive. I have a copy of it and, uh, I keep intending to read it. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm trying to remember where it is right now, <laughs> probably on the bookshelf right behind me. And I have just forgotten it. Um, but shop class is one of those books that like I buy used copies when I come across them and I just give them to people. It's yeah. that good of a book. Yeah. I just gave it as a Christmas present to someone myself. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a, I, I think maybe the, the point of intersection between Persig's discussion of quality and uh, Crawford's uh, discussion of the value of working with your hands um, has to do with a sense of satisfaction. Yeah. And I think that that's part of what you're describing. Um, but it, it's, it's also a type of satisfaction that is unavailable in mind work because you do not, I mean, it, the physical work not only lets you know when you are wrong, it also confirms when you're right. Yeah. And that experience of, uh, I actually was effective in making something the way I wanted it to be. And now it serves me. Yeah. Um, that, that is a, a, an incredibly, a uh, powerful confirmation of a person's uh, not, not just that they have a skill set, but that they are um, they have a kind of power in the world. And that's a really fulfilling experience. And it enriches the, the experience of motorcycling and, and other things too, but, yeah. but certainly motorcycling because we are, very often kind of dependent upon ourselves uh, out on the road or out on the trail mm -hmm. and um, being able to take care of oneself in that way is a, it really accrues to a, 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 a person's self-confidence and self-esteem in uh, a, a kind of global sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it um, one of the things that I've been thinking of as we've been talking about that sense of alienation is, you know, something as, as simple as cruise control can change, change, completely change the level of interaction that I have with my motorcycle. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I never took a long trip on a motorcycle with cruise control until this past summer I rode from where I live in Virginia to the MOA rally in Montana and back 5,500 miles. Uh, not, not really that amazing of a trip when you think about it, uh, especially compared to some of the stuff that I've done uh, in my younger days when I had a sturdier butt. Um, but having cruise control allowed me on some of those long stretches, in, especially out in, in Montana, once you get past the Mississippi River, there's a lot of empty road that yeah. is broken up by small towns and, and uh, you know, farming communities and things like that. There's a lot of road where the speed limit's 65 miles an hour or higher and being able to just put it on cruise and have the motorcycle control my speed. It's one thing I didn't have to pay attention to. And it allowed me to experience what was going on around me at a little deeper level. Because there was that was one more thing that I didn't have to pay attention to on the motorcycle, and you know you only have you have a hundred percent attention, mm -hmm. and you know I don't know how much throttle control takes of that, but I was able to take away that throttle control attention percentage and give it to, hey, was that really a barbed wire snowman that I saw on the side of the road? <laughs> right, right. You know? No, this, and I think this is the counter argument for the people who uh, would say rider aids um, decrease uh, a rider's involvement. 
uh, I think that the involvement can just be transferred. And right. so, uh, you know, if I don't have to be worried about, you know, my traction coming out of a corner, uh, because I know my computer is going to manage that, I can pay more attention to line selection, or I can right. be, you know, scanning the road more vigilantly, or, you know, something else can take its place. Now, obviously, it doesn't have to work that way. Sure. If, I, if I'm on doing cruise control on my bike, which I have now for the first time, and it, it's like magic, isn't it? It is. It, 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 it was really freaky. I resisted using it for a long time. And then I, I started using it and I was like, oh, okay. Actually, I don't feel alienated from the bike um, because in a, in a split second with the slightest touch of my brake, or, you know, if I reach up to the button, I can disengage it uh, if I want to, but I felt grateful to the bike because it, yeah, it relieved me of a certain burden. Yeah, um, and uh, so I it was an endearing thing, not a an alienating thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I I don't when people say, you know, we really ought to do without all these rider aids. I ask them if they have a calculator because I don't think anybody really feels the need anymore to be able to do long division um by hand yeah by hand. yeah no uh, but you know it in uh in why we drive persig makes uh crawford persig, crawford That's makes right. a couple points um that i want to just repeat here briefly uh one is that driver aids in a car and i think this can transfer in some cases to a motorcycle they not only allow for distracted driving, like if I'm on cruise control, I can look at my phone, um, but they also starve people of the kind of stimulation that creates a desire for a distraction and some kind of extraneous entertainment. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was really a, a very interesting point. And, and another is that, I mean, he, in why we drive, he's really uh, making the point that as, as AI takes over uh, driving, it's really going to deprive people of some very important uh, developmental, uh, well, some very important development that driving cultivates like driving a vehicle skillfully and responsibly means you have to develop coordination, judgment, mm -hmm. uh, appreciation of morality and, and the interpersonal world, appreciation of physics and the natural world. Um, automation can preclude that kind of development. Uh, and we, enter a kind of electron induced anesthesia. And um, that, that would be really problematic. We end up with um, AI that's not uh, the Skynet from Terminator, but uh, WALL-E, that, that movie <laughs> where uh, uh, the, the cute little trash compactor robot. Yeah. The technology had catered to humanity's limitless desire for passive coddling and it eradicated any confrontation with meaning or purpose mm -hmm. and, you know, taken to its extreme, that certainly would be tragic. Um, I don't think that's exactly where we are with rider aids these days, but Crawford, um, may prove to be a visionary on this count. And oh, wow. that, that really would be uh, a, a level of alienation, not only from the machine, but even from ourselves and yeah. each other. And um, it would certainly lead to an extraordinarily low quality existence. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. So before we get going, Mark, I want to recommend uh, not just to you, but to uh, anybody who feels intimidated by electrical issues on motorcycles or any motor vehicle, to tell you the truth, it's a 
it's a book written by Dan Sullivan and it's called fundamental electrical troubleshooting. And the sub title is electricity explained in a way that makes it useful for mechanics. Now I don't consider myself a mechanic in any stretch of the imagination, but I found this book incredibly useful and I'm not going to say it's easy to understand, but it is straightforward and you do not need a lot of knowledge ahead of time. It is geared more towards heavy trucks, like, you know, big diesel rigs, but uh, it is a fantastic reference book. Um, It's spiral bound. So you can lay it flat open on a a workbench or um, work, work area. And it's only printed on uh, the front side of the page. So there's tons of space to take notes and draw extra diagrams. It's about a 200 page book. Um, and uh, I got my copy through Amazon after taking a basic motorcycle electrical systems seminar offered by a local independent shop. Uh, and that once again, it's called fundamental electrical troubleshooting by Dan Sullivan. It's just a fantastic reference book for all things electrical in motor vehicles. Oh, that sounds like an excellent resource. In fact, if you heard a a little uh, crash while you were speaking, I was reaching for my pen and (laughs) accidentally knocked my lamp over right next to the mic. But yeah, I will definitely get that. That sounds wonderful. I'll put links for um, Zen and both of Crawford's books and this books over on Amazon, um, as well as your book too, because a lot of people may not know that you wrote a book called why we ride. Um, that was a collection of, uh, of a lot of your old columns that you wrote for motorcycle consumer news. That's right. Yeah. Well, thanks for mentioning it. Yeah. And, uh, uh, given that we're recording this, uh, as winter, uh, really begins in earnest. Um, maybe uh, reading some of these things will allow people to uh, not feel too alienated from their avocation there when they go. can't ride. There you go. Well, cool, man. I will. Uh, I will talk to you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Wes. We'd love to answer your questions, too, so send them to podcast at bmwmoa.org. Visit our website at therideinside.com to listen to every episode of the podcast and read more of Mark's writing on various motorcycle-related topics. The best way to support The Ride Inside is by joining the BMW Motorcycle Owners of America. Yes, it says BMW right in the name, but we absolutely do not care what bike you ride. We know what's most important. The MOA is all about the community of riders, not a single brand. You can join as a digital member for $39 a year or as a traditional member for $49 a year. The biggest difference is digital members don't get a hard copy of the monthly magazine in their mailbox. They access the BMW Owners News online. Each membership supports digital offerings like the Ride Inside as well as everything else the MOA does. Find out more at bmwmoa.org. Ride along with us on the internet. The MOA and all its digital productions are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you out there somewhere on the road, or off it. Ride safe. <laughs>